Hello everyone, today I'm going to talk briefly about going full screen with Monogame, and then I'm going to talk about how to optimize the math of our circle drawing algorithm. First of all, to go full screen, I'm going to make a function in our utility class, and I'm simply going to call this uh, toggle full screen, and then we're going to pass in the graphics device manager. The only thing you really need to do here is tell the graphics that you want to toggle full screen. But I'm going to add one more line to this, and it's called Hardware Mode Switch. Hardware Mode Switch allows you to tell Monogame what type of full screen window do we want. Do we want a full screen window where the graphics device has exclusive control of that window? Or do we want a full screen window which is a borderless window that's been stretched to fit the whole screen? For my purposes, I'm going to say that I want the Hardware Mode Switch to be false. And what that'll do is it's going to take the window, remove the border, and stretch it to fit the whole monitor screen. You get a borderless window that stretches to fill the whole screen, and it'll make toggling between applications really quick. If you want to, for example, hit Alt-Tab and switch between different windows or applications really quickly, if hardware mode switch is set to false, you'll be able to do it really quickly. And let's go ahead and test that out. I'm just going to make a key click that will just toggle the full screen. If the keyboard F key is clicked, then we want to toggle the full screen. And let's just see how that looks. Oh, it wants us to pass in the graphics device manager. Okay, there we go. So I just hit the F key, it's stretched to fill the whole screen, and I can toggle really quickly between all the windows I have open, back to my application, and if I hit F key again, okay, now we're back in the windowed mode. Let's move on to optimizing the math of our circle drawing routine. Here's the circle drawing routine we had. Let's see, at the very bottom here. You can see we're calling two sine functions and two cosine functions. We don't really need to do all of that. Here's our draw circle function. We can optimize the math we're doing here for drawing circles and get rid of, well, initially we'll get rid of a couple of these trigonometric functions because Using the sine and cosine is going to be a lot slower than just addition and multiplication and subtraction. I'd like to get rid of these completely, but at the same time, I don't expect to see huge performance gains like we did when we optimized the line drawing algorithm. I think we're going to be bottlenecked by the line drawing algorithm as it's sending information to the graphics card in the with the flush command. And so I think we will see some performance gains but not uh, huge amounts like we did with the line drawing algorithm itself. Let's go ahead and talk about how we can optimize this math. Uh, first of all, we can just take this portion, this AX and AY calculation, and we can move it right out of the loop. All we need to do is now come down here at the end, and we need to save AX will now be BX, and AY will now be BY. What we're actually doing here, we can draw, here's the circle we were drawing before. Here's AX and AY, and then here's BX and BY. Okay, so this is our first loop, and then we draw the line. Well, the next time we loop, let's just go ahead and set AX to this. This will become the new BX, BY. Okay, and then we'll draw the line. And so that's what we're doing here. We calculate AX and AY outside the loop. Then we calculate the next point at BX, BY, and then we draw the line, and then we now save the second point back to the first point. And then we'll just keep looping until we draw the whole thing. So that'll make that a little bit more efficient. But we can actually take out the sine and cosine completely. And the way you do that is by using the rotation, the two-dimensional rotation algorithm, instead of calculating the sine and cosine. So we can calculate the sine and cosine one time at the beginning of the loop, and then use that sine and cosine, just keep rotating the point around the origin by the sine and cosine until we get back to the beginning. So we go ahead and plot this point, and we know what this point is going to be. It's simply uh, on the x, it's the radius, and then the y is just on the 0, so the y will be 0. Okay, so super simple to get that one. So let's go ahead and put that in here. I'm going to take these values out and start making some new ones. So we're going to have ax is going to be now the radius, and ay is going to be 0. That's our starting point. I'm going to take out the delta angle. And then the angle is what I'm going to call the angle of rotation. In fact, instead of calling it angle, and let's, yeah, let's, just, let's just remove that. I'm going to call this, make a value called rotation. And this is just going to be the amount we want to rotate. And the amount we want to rotate 
is just this value we had for delta angle. So we'll just copy that and let's bring it down here. So we have the beginning position of the circle. We have the amount we want to rotate. Let's pre-calculate the sine and cosine of that rotation. So the sine of the rotation is going to be that and the cosine is going to be that. So far we have everything we need to start. Now we need to apply the rotation formula to get to the next point. And let's just go ahead and search for what that looks like. We want the two-dimensional rotation formula. And we can probably click on any one of these. Let's just start the first one there. Here we have the formula for two-dimensional rotation. I'm just going to copy this, go back to our code, and paste it in here so I can see it as I'm rewriting. And what this formula says is we have the x2 and the y2. And this basically says these are the new points. This is our new x and our new y. And over here, we have the old x. The x1 is the old x, and the old y, the y1. And so down here, instead of incrementing by delta angle, we're just going to calculate the new values. bx, which is the new x, is going to be the cosine of the rotation times the original x, which is ax. Then we're going to subtract the sine of the angle of rotation times the original y, which is ay. And haven't defined that yet, so I'm just going to put it up here. We'll put uh, bx is equal to zero, just to define them before we go into the loop. Okay, we'll get rid of this. And then we're going to say that the by is now equal to the sine of the angle of rotation times the original x plus the cosine of the angle of rotation times the original y. Here's the first point, here's the second point, and now we can draw the line. So we haven't translated the circle to, to be at this new center yet. We've just creating a circle about the origin at a specific radius, but now we need to translate. The translation will just add in the x and the y to each of the components. And then afterwards, we're going to save bx and by as the new starting point, ax and ay, and then we'll calculate the new second point here by rotating again. Let's go ahead and run this and just make sure it's working. So we have a draw polygon code here. We're going to put the draw circle code back in and just make sure it looks the same. There we are, and there's our circle. It should be exactly the same as we had before. It's just calculating it using a slightly different math algorithm. The math algorithm itself should be more efficient, but I don't think we're going to see performance gains of twice like we did in the line drawing algorithm because we are spending a lot of time here in the draw line function flushing the data. And we can go ahead and test to see what kind of gains we're getting. In fact, uh, let me copy this. So here's the new algorithm. I made a copy so we have two of them. The first one I'm going to call draw circle slow. I'm going to put this back to the way it was when we started. So we'll get rid of all of this and this. Okay, get rid of that. We're going to move the AX and AY back into the loop. Calculate our delta angle, and then we'll advance the angle by the delta angle. This is where we started beforehand, where we had the sine and cosine in the loop. I've called this one draw circle slow, and I've then I've called this one draw circle, and I need to put a bracket in there. got deleted. I'm going to go ahead and remove all of this old code that's commented, and I'll get rid of that. We have basically the two algorithms out there. Let's go ahead. We can test them just to see what they look like. I'm going to get rid of these vertices because we were drawing a random polygon. I'm going to get rid of that. We're not going to draw that anymore. Uh, let me get rid of the rest of this shape drawing stuff. I'm just going to make a list of circle data. And to do that, I'm going to make a read-only struct that's called circle. It's going to have an x, a y, a radius, and a color. And we'll go ahead and populate that in the constructor. So here's the circle. Okay, so now that we can store circle data, let's go ahead and make an array of circles. So we'll have circle array. Call that circles. We're just going to put a thousand items in there. A thousand circles. Let's loop through each circle and create one. Okay, we want to get a random x, a random y. The radius, I'm just going to make a constant 32. And the color, I'm going to make random as well. So we're going to specify the red, green, and blue for that. And then once we have the red, green, and blue, we can 
create the new circle. And then we'll set the circle array data. So now all we have to do is generate the random data. We already have the random object up there. First of all, let's get the camera screen extents. So we're going to get extents. And we have a vector 2 that can get the camera min and the camera max. And we're going to pass that out. Now what I want to do is I want to generate circles at random points between the minimum and maximum of what the camera can actually see. So we just start at the min x for the x, and then we add in a random value, which we're going to cast to a floating point. This will be a random floating point double, cast to a float. Then we're going to multiply that by the difference between the max x and the min x. And actually, I'm just going to copy this for the y. So y will be the same thing, except now we're using the y values for everything. And then the red, green, and blue components, next double again, multiplied by the maximum we want. So we want numbers between 0 and 255, so I'm just going to put 255 here. And then we're going to cast this to be an integer value. And this is a function call, so I need the brackets. And actually I'm just going to copy this again. And we're going to call this red, green, and blue. So now we should have random circles with random colors throughout the screen in the view of the camera at this radius. Let's go ahead and loop through and draw those. Okay, we'll get the circle data. And let's populate the fields here. So we're going to have circle x, um, the radius. Uh, the number of points, I'm just going to set this to 32. And then one will be fine for the, the thickness. So that should draw a bunch of random circles. There we go. And it drew them all white for some reason. So let's figure out why it's doing that. But it looks, other than that, it looks really good. Oh, it's because I told it white here. <laughs> we actually need to pass in the color value. So circle color. OK, perfect. So we have a 1,000 circles on the screen. Let's go ahead and get a stopwatch in here to determine how fast this is running. And I'll just set this here to be a new stopwatch. At the beginning, we're going to restart the stopwatch. And at the end, we're going to stop. And then up here inside our tilde function, I'm going to get rid of this camera extent. So I know that's working. Let's go ahead and draw to the console the elapsed time on the watch in milliseconds. OK, so we're running in debug mode. Let's go ahead and just see what we get for values in debug. OK, so eight, nine, between eight and a half, nine and a half milliseconds. We'll switch this to release, and let's see what our new values say. OK, so about 4.756, 4.7. That was actually the optimized version. Let's go ahead and put the unoptimized, and let's just see if, what kind of gains we got. And as we're doing that, I noticed in my, my trial line code, when we reverted back to the previous version, I was putting this, I was adding x back in there when we already added it over here. So I need to get rid of that just to get back to the way we were, and so things look correct. OK, so let me just double check. That looks fine now. And then this one has all the right values. So let's go ahead and try the slow version again and just see what it looks like. There's that one. And we are getting about 5.7, 5.6, 5.7. And then we're going to go ahead. Let's try the optimized version now and see how much faster that one is. OK, so 4.7, 4.8. So it looks like we shaved off about a millisecond. And if we look at the difference there, we can take 4.7 and divide that by 5.6 and subtract it from 1 times 100. And so we got about a 16% increase in performance just from uh, switching the math. Now, the math functions themselves are quite a bit faster, but I think we're limited now by the amount of flush commands we have to issue with all of the lines we're drawing. Since we're drawing so many lines with all the circles, because each circle is drawing 32 lines, and each line is two triangles. So since we have so many flush commands, I think that's eating away at some of the performance gains we would normally see with the optimization to the math. It is a decent amount faster there with, with the optimized math.